Our cameraman is Paul Williams. The interviewer is Ann Gallivan. Uh, Kitty Tucker is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin at Madison and subsequently earned her law degree at the Antioch School of Law here in D.C. She has a long history of environmental health and anti-nuclear work and was a leader of the Washington, D.C. Karen Silkwood campaign, which is primarily what we will discuss today. So Kitty, let's start at the beginning. How did you first become interested in these anti-nuclear and environmental issues? Uh, and about when did you start working on the Karen Silkwood issue? I first heard, or read the name of Karen Silkwood in a 1974 article in the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And the article suggested that Kermagee Corporation, which operated a plutonium processing facility uh, just north of Oklahoma City, uh, declared that they thought, thought she had uh, somehow poisoned herself with uh, plutonium I to see. make the company look bad. Because right. at that po t point in time, Kermagee Corporation claimed that plutonium could not cause cancer and that therefore she was uh, an alarmist. Well, why don't you, now that you've... Um told us a little bit about Karen Silkwood. This is probably the time to go into the whole case against against Karen Silkwood by Kermagee and others, and then we can go on to what that particular campaign led to later. So what is the Karen Silkwood story? Was it, uh, she well, was a worker at the Kermagee plant, plant right? Cimarron facility, uh -huh. and she worked in the plutonium fabrication plant. Uh -huh. And uh, as part of her job, she was to oversee the, uh, some of the health and safety and issues at the plant. And um, so I first read this article and I went, no woman would be dumb enough to, to purposely contaminate herself with plutonium. And I wondered how they could say that. Then I read an article in New Times, uh, a magazine that was uh, being published then and, and covered progressive issues, which gave more details about the case. Then Ms. Magazine printed an article, and then Howard Cohn wrote an article for Rolling Stone magazine, which had a lot of very important details in it. We were learned, these, excuse me, were these all when she was still alive or had she already died? She had already died. Okay. And so they were talking about why they thought her death was suspicious. Karen Silkwood was on her way to a meeting with a New York Times reporter, um, a national OCAW union official, Steve Wadka, mm -hmm. um, and her boyfriend, Drew Stevens and they were to meet in Oklahoma City. Karen left a union meeting and uh, a woman named Jean noticed that Karen was carrying a notebook in a manila covered envelope and Karen said that these were the do important documents to prove uh, to the New York Times reporter that there were issues about the safety of the fuel rods being sent off for a breeder reactor out in Washington State. So the Karen, Karen was already a whistleblower. Uh, yes. For McGee and um, and they didn't want her to they didn't want her to be speaking out basically. So about ten days before. She actually was run off the road and killed. Uh, she found herself contaminated after working in a glove box uh, because they did understand that plutonium was very dangerous and could be, explode if it was all pushed into a concentrated area and that's why it worked well as an explosive bomb. 
and the bomb dropped by the United States on Nagasaki mm -hmm. was a plutonium field bomb. Mm -hmm. My husband was at the time working on uh, nuclear proliferation uh, issues for the Environmental Policy Center. And he had worked before that for Senator Aberesk from South Dakota. And did he work for Aberesk, Jim Aberesk, on, on, that, on that particular issue? No. No, it was on other things, but he. Okay. Yeah. But he discovered that uh, women were being. Sterile, Native American women were being sterilized so that the surgeons could get more practice with the procedure. Mm -hmm. And that got uh, his boss's name in the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he went from being a volunteer intern to actually being given a small salary. Mm -hmm. uh, in after reading these three articles, I, my husband brought home a report that was supposedly written by an independent committee. Uh, and it found that, oh, they claimed that there wasn't really a problem at the uh, Kermagee facility. And Excuse me, the Kermagee so, facility also had very well placed friends in Congress, correct? Yes. Yes. So the whole the whole industry the, was, was threatened. The whole nuclear industry the, was really threatened by these possible revelations. They had sent Senator Kerr to uh, Congress mm -hmm. when he ran for the that office, and uh, but by the time this incident occurred, uh, Senator Kerr had passed away, but. Dean McGee was still around as uh, mm -hmm. the head of the corporation. And they had a lot to lose by uh, having this information go public about people being contaminated by working there or even being near there. We, I subsequently gained access to all the publicly available reports that the Atomic Energy Commission, which then around that time became the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, mm -hmm. but it was the same people on the report, same people were cited as writing the reports as uh -huh. had been writing reports under the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh -huh. um, I'd like to explain that uh, when I read the article in the Washington Post, I was almost eight months pregnant with my daughter, Amber, mm -hmm. and she was born in December. And so I was nursing and working with the National Organization Women as sort of the state representative on legislative issues. And even though DC wasn't a state, uh, we had a chap Washington, D.C. chapter, mm -hmm. and meetings were very well attended, and they could afford postage stamps. <laughs> and who was in that coalition in Washington, D.C., when you sort of started meeting regularly? What groups or what individuals? Well, I was, on the same day that I was accepted as a student at Antioch School of Law, the following year, 1975, uh, my husband was asked to look for another job by his boss because there was a lot of uproar over his defense of Native Americans. And, uh, and your Bob had been part of the, working on those is issues. So your husband was also working on the same issues that you were. Your husband is uh, Bob Alvarez. Yes. Right. So you 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 worked and on so, many of the same issues together, didn't you? Yes. So was he part of the Karen Silkwood campaign? Yes. And who else was? Um, besides you and he. Well, what? okay. So who's in that coalition besides Robert Alvarez well, and Kitty Tucker? Yeah. Um. 
someone from I started speaking about the Karen Silkwood case over the summer mm -hmm. and I went to a women's socialist meeting at Antioch School of Law in Ohio mm -hmm. and began circulating a petition asking Congress to look into this whole case and explaining quickly in the petition who Karen Silkwood was, when she died, and why there was reason to su suspect that her death was not an accident. So Karen Silkwood was driving from a union meeting up near the Cimarron facility down to Oklahoma City to meet with New York Times reporter David Burnham, mm -hmm. Steve Wadka, a representative of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union, mm -hmm. who worked in the, their legislative office in Washington, D.C., and uh, her boyfriend, Drew Stevens. Mm -hmm. And they, the three men sat and waited and waited and waited and finally they started making phone calls to other union members. They learned that Karen had left the meeting and that she, she had apparently been in an accident is what they were told. Mm -hmm. And they went out to the site of the accident. They found a, Karen's paycheck on the ground and uh, they looked inside the car and there did not appear to be any of the documents that Jean saw when uh, Karen spoke with her before leaving the, the hmm. union meeting. The Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union had survived a decertification election partly because the uh, bargaining committee, which included uh, Jack Tice and Jerry uh, Brewer, had uh, helped, had pulled together where Donald Giesman and um, another scientist mm -hmm. uh, had come down to a tell the workers about the dangers of plutonium and the alpha part particles uh, emitted by plutonium. And eventually we ended up in a trial in court and uh, Dr. John Goffman, mm -hmm. uh, who lived in San Francisco, California, came out for the trial and he gave the uh, jury a very good basic education in the dangers of ionizing radiation. And he said that the main forms they were con concerned with were gamma rays, beta rays, and alpha particles. Now this, can I ask you a question back up a little bit? The trial that you're talking about is Karen Silver. Far in the far in the future far in, in the terms future. of our o local organizing. Oh, okay, all right. So I'm just trying to. And the yeah. trial was against whom by whom? Um, oh. The Karen Silkwood Estate. Okay. Versus. Against Kermagee Corporation. Okay. All right. Can you say that again without um, you? Uh, okay. Cho the trial was involved. The Karen Silkwood Estate, and it was held held in a federal court because uh, Kermagee Corporation had such sway over the state courts that people there told us we didn't have a chance. Uh, okay. And there was diversity um, amongst the where Kermagee was based in Oklahoma. Her father, who was the, the executor of her estate, lived in Texas. And so there was, that allowed them to get 
into federal court. Okay. Thank you. Um, but I had only been accepted at law school, mm -hmm. but I thought I'd put enough facts into my petition that most of the women at this particular conference would sign it. So I stood in the lunch line with my daughter in a stroller and uh, gave people, I had a couple uh, sets of peti petitions that, so that they, a couple people at a time could read over the petition and sign it or decide they didn't want to. But most of the people signed it. And so that was my first effort to start forming some sort of organization. A coalition. Yeah. And so I started accepting an invitation to speak at any of the local Washington, D.C. area groups. Um, and so did you speak specifically? Did you go right to the Karen Silkwood case when you spoke to them? Or did you talk about other things related to that? What, was the, what were the topics uh, that you... Um, I mainly focused on the Karen Silkwood case and the reasons that people believed that her car had been run off the road. Um, after Karen's death, one of the major uh, television uh, networks went out and used a sim similar Honda and drove along the road where Karen had gone off the road and where her car hit a concrete under, underground viaduct and was and she was killed in that crash. Um, they, and her boyfriend, Drew Stevens, who worked on cars, saw that there was a new dent in her back bumper. And he called in an accident investigator to look at the uh, scene of, of where the so-called accident occurred. Now, most roads are designed so that there's a slight angle so that the water and snow will wash off the road or slide off the road. And so therefore, most sleepy drivers veer off the road when they fall asleep. <laughs> uh, but the accident investigator found tracks leading on the left-hand side of the road. And he said, he, this looked like there was a vehicle preventing her from getting back on the road. And it did not appear that she was out of control um, because these tracks stayed on the edge of the road. And the outcome might have been different except for this concrete viaduct. There was, um, further up the road, there was a spot where the road intersected with a smaller road and from which a vehicle might have been following her. The dent in the back of the car suggested that the vehicle might have hit her from behind, which that may have caused her to cross over. And uh, so the t this television network tried to imitate what might have occurred. And the car, at the point where they spotted these tracks on the other side of the road, the car kept continuously just veered off to the right. And they said they didn't think and the accident investigator reported that di this did not appear to be a case of a sleepy driver. It appeared to be a case of the car having been hit from behind mm -hmm. and uh, then prevented from regaining the roadway. So this, this television network special must have then 
caused a real uptick in interest. Yes. In the Karen Silken case. Yes. So at this point... But this, yeah. this occurred um, later than I began organizing. Okay. Well, the, we had the accident investigation report, but uh, we didn't see the, the television coverage until later. Okay. Um, the years that this, the, the years in which this was building, 73, 74, 75, were years also that um, after the end of the Vietnam War, there was, uh, there was renewed interest on the part of at least the American public um, in nuclear issues. Yes. And so this was, this was, would have been one of the bigger ones to, for people to grapple with, you know, the dangers of, at the front end of the nuclear uh, creation stuff, plutonium and other minerals that were used in, in, in the, I guess you call them just factories. Uh, so you must have been riding a little bit of a wave and, and, and then pretty soon everybody was talking about Karen Silkwood. I do remember that from the mid-70s. So what did you do So Karen died yeah. on November 13th, 1974. Okay. So I was in the following spring um, began the organ organizing and circulating the petition to groups to whom I spoke. And uh, when I spoke to Women's Strike for Peace, one of its members offered to hold a fundraiser at her home. Mm -hmm. And so we had our first fundraiser and we used that to st establish a local organizing committee. And Patricia Naimond, who later went on to work for National Public Radio, served as the coordinator for and that. that. What was your name? Patricia Naimond. Naimond. Yeah, Patricia Naimond. And uh, she recruited an attorney named Danny Sheehan. And Danny Sheehan and Sarah Nelson got along very well. Uh, and so Sarah Nelson was the co-chair of the National Organization for Women Labor Task Force. Mm -hmm. And I had, had met her in the spring when we were doing a campaign for a uh, woman's right to control her own body and her own health and her own pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And at the free clinic, we were started doing uh, the pregnancy tests with the patient there watching. Mm -hmm. And instead of keeping it a mysterious activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, that was, I worked with the local free clinic I had been um, active on the lobbying with the with Narrow, and uh, that year there was a, a an effort to deny a woman's right to choose, which we succeeded in pre preventing it from be becoming a new law. Okay, now certain threads are coming together in these years. There's a large women's health network that you're talking about. Yes. Uh, there's the Karen Silkwood case, which is about plutonium poisoning. And um, didn't you at some point in here also work with radiation victims? Was that part of the Karen Silkwood? That was later. That was later. But that it was related to developed the because the more I learned about plutonium, the more concerned I became about the proposals to have breeder reactors run on plutonium. First, but let me explain yeah. what Dr. John Goffman yes. told the jury when we eventually got to trial, got to trial in a district court. Uh, he described plutonium as an alpha emitter, and he said, that there were three types of radiation that they were concerned with. Um, 
gamma radiation, which is very similar to x-rays. It goes through the body and it can either damage the cell, kill off the cell, or completely miss the cell. Of, of, uh, and we have a lot of cells in our body. Mm -hmm. uh, so any cell that had been, had been damaged but not killed off might be mutated and later cause cancer. Beta radiation does not go very far, unlike gamma radiation, which is more like x-rays. And so beta radiation is considered a, a lesser damaging cell. But alpha radiation, he, he, he described the, the first two as, well, he described gamma radiation as shooting a rifle. Right, and except it, it's on the cellular level instead of a, like a bullet. Mm -hmm. And uh, beta radiation would have to be, uh, you could, your, one's clothing could protect uh, okay. people from beta radiation. Uh, and alpha radiation gets inside the body. Is that the worst? Through the air, through, or th through food, or through water, or through exposure at work. And uh, he said that the alpha radiation is like a little machine gun. So wherever the radiation, radioactive uh, alpha particle lodges within the body and there are lots of places that, that it likes to go mm -hmm. and then it, it stays there and it's like a machine gun constantly bombarding the, mm -hmm. the surrounding cells and uh, therefore it can easily cause a cancer. Um, Karen Silkwood about 10 days before uh, her death, had shown contamination at work. And so they wanted her to collect all her urine and fecal samples uh, so they could determine how much uh, plutonium she had been exposed to. The Atomic Energy Commission established later that the alpha, uh, or the plutonium source, which they found in her samples and on the food in her apartment, uh, were uh, very damaging. So they sent Karen, her boyfriend Drew Stevens, and uh, her apartment mate out to be tested at Los Alamos and Karen showed a very high exposure to, to the plutonium and Dr. Goffman stated that she was it was like she was married to cancer oh. it was going to be an inevitable uh, ending factor for her life but her activism an effort to warn the public about the fuel rod failings of the Cimarron Corporation operated by Kerr McGee uh, was tragically interrupted when her car was run off the road and the documents that she was taking to the New York Times reporter disappeared. They disappeared? Yes. And later, uh, the, her colleagues, Jack Tice and Jerry, uh, were able to establish that Karen had uh, been alert mm -hmm. and 
had not just fallen asleep on on the road to one of the most important meetings of her life. Yeah. Did they ever find who did it? No. Her killers have never been identified, but I was uh, when I was out on the west coast talking with people, I met some workers who had uh, suffered similar kinds of bashings from behind uh -huh. by unknown parties in their cars. And uh, Jean Young, the, the woman who saw Karen leaving with the documents, had been followed home and had become very nervous about uh, what had ha happened. And the formation of our local group occurred after the fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Silkwood case um, sort of my p participating or deciding to do something resulted from meeting with a congressional staffer whose boss had requested the uh, report from an independent group of people. Mm -hmm. And these independent, this independent group of some people were basically experts on breeder reactors, or they claimed they were experts because uh, the world has not had a lot of uh, luck with breeder reactors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Patty Naaman uh, began recruiting other people to join our committee and we called it, initially we called it Sisters of Silkwood. Oh, and who, who, who um, you know, some of the people, or the groups that were involved in that, Women's Strike for Peace, who else was there in, the, in that, at that point? Peace groups, environmental groups, uh -huh. yeah, group. religious groups, right. uh -huh. um, labor unions, and uh, so we had quite a crowd when these petitions, when we ultimately <coughs> presented our petitions to Congress. Okay. And when, when was that that you, pre that you presented the petition to Congress on behalf of this large coalition? 75, 76? I think it was 75. 75, okay. In the fall. And what happened then? In, in Congress, did anything happen? Um, nothing happened in the Senate, which is yeah. the bec uh, when I met, I went down and met with the uh, staffer who had requested this report by the, the so-called independent committee, and uh, I said, "Well, aren't you a little concerned about this report?" And he said he was, but that at the moment it wasn't um, a high priority. And so without public pressure, he doubted that we could really do anything. And that led me to go, well, I'll write a petition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took it with me and got started getting signatures and then in August, when uh, people, s s the, the end of August is the day where the women's right to vote mm -hmm. in the United States elections occurred. And I was supposed to be uh, going to the meetings a three-day 
series of meetings for freshmen at the Antioch School of Law. While while you're doing all this incredible coalition work, you have a new baby, right? I have a new baby, and you had another kid, right? An older kid, right? Yes. Yeah, and, and my... you're in law school. Yes. Right? So you're doing all this while you're trying to juggle all that the classic activist uh, dilemma. And you, we lived you... in a group house, <laughs> or I don't think we could have done it. <laughs> You mean you had help with child care, among other things, right? Yeah. Right. We w so there was, we had a rotating responsibilities for cooking and cleaning up. Yeah. And uh, we had a very low rent because a rent control law had just come into being. And so they, our rent sort of stayed about the same. And we then would add up the rent and the uh, utilities and the food because we ate together every evening. And uh, this group eventually met with uh, Congressman Dingle. Dingle, John Dingle from John Michigan, Dingle. Michigan, right? Yes, who decided that he would hold hearings since the Senate senator that we had initially presented our petitions to was not taking action to, to hold hearings. What was Dingle's particular interest in this? He was Mr. Automobile always in Congress. You know, they, everything would do with automobiles. Is yes, funny. but, what but was his we almost lost Detroit due to a beta reactor accident. Oh, that's why, right? And so that's why he was interested in this issue. And he held it held the hearings in the small business committee and the Republicans argued that they, they, this group should not have any hearings uh, and because this wasn't about small businesses and so Dingle said well small businesses can't even get involved because there are these big pro-nuclear organizations that are running facilities or building nuclear power plants and uh, therefore he thought it was very important that they look into this issue. So the congressional, the congressional staffer who uh, asked us to submit our what we our testimony to him ahead of time so he would you know sort of have some idea of how to put the hearing together he asked the FBI for their documents about the Karen Silkwood case and he said that he got a stack of documents about this high um, and in it the name Jackie Saruji appeared and she was living in Tennessee, which has a big nuclear facility mm -hmm. uh, for developing what, and actually um, got out the uranium they used in the first bomb dropped on Japan mm -hmm. at Hiroshima. And The uh, so when first of all some scientists testified about the general dangers of breeder reactors, and then Sarah Nelson and I testified about why we were concerned and what we knew, and. Uh, then they called Jackie Saruji, oh, the union leaders, I think both Tony Mazaka mm -hmm. and Steve Wadka testified. And 
then we were followed by a woman named Jackie Sabruji. And she claimed she'd seen a stack of documents this high on the desk of one of the FBI um, officers. And she was working for the Nashville Tennessean, mm -hmm. which is an, was a newspaper. And her boss was quite unhappy to discover that she was acting as an agent for the FBI mm -hmm. and was uh, reporting on issues related to her job to the FBI, mm -hmm. trying to find something that would change the posture of the newspaper. And the posture of her newspaper was what? Questioning the need for nuclear power okay, plants. Okay. Can you state that as a full sentence? The Nashville Tennessean was questioning the need for nuclear power okay. plants. So they were skeptical. Yeah. Right. Okay. They they weren't pro or anti, they the just had were yeah. Publishing the questions that the, many in the public were gr growing to have. And I guess I, I strayed from my story, but for the local organizing, uh -huh. I uh, we had called the head of the National Organization for Women to see if she would support this, the uh, effort to learn more about the Karen Silkwood case and get congressional hearings. And at the last minute, it, she arranged her schedule so that she could come down and join us on the Women's Suffrage Day. Um, at the end of uh, August, and we went to a meeting in the building, FBI building, and we noticed a lot of cameras, you know, outside the door as we were being ushered in. But I just assumed they were for somebody else. And as it turned out, I started taking notes and immediately became concerned about how little these FBI agents appeared to know about the Karen Silkwood death. Mm. Um, they referred to a red folder that Karen carried, and actually it was a manila envelope in which she carried the, the documents that she wanted to show to the New York Times reporter. And so I started asking them questions. <laughs> and uh, I didn't, I ended up speaking when all I planned to do was sit there quietly and take notes. And uh, they sort of had to admit that there were questions that had. The FBI we, had to admit this finally, that there were questions that we had that. raised. Right. But they didn't want to do anything they about didn't. it, yeah. is what they stated at, at the time. And so Karen DeCrow, who had not read all, all of the documents that Sarah Nelson and I had. Karen, Karen DeCrow was now? Yes, she was yeah, she the was president the, of well, now. And, 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 okay. and she came out and, and she was also an attorney whereas I was merely a beginning law student. Mm -hmm. And she came out and told the, all of the cameras that had been in the hall, they shooed us down the stairs. But fortunately, it was a sunny day. And uh, she said, the FBI is engaged in a cover-up of what's, what has been going on at the Cimarron facility and that she thought this was something that had to be looked into by Congress. And I was very pleased that 
she, after hearing what the interchange, agreed with my conclusion that the FBI w would prefer to cover it all up. And uh, the hearings that were eventually held on the Karen Silkwood case uh, were sort of initiated by the media coverage we got on that day. So it, all, it did end up going before Congress, Congressional hearing. Yes. Who, who sponsored the hearing in Congress? John Dingell. They, okay, so it was John Dingell's. And then, somewhere around the end of that time, there was the meltdown at Three Mile Island, or the accident at Three Mile Island, correct? Well, the, Didn't that all blend into it somehow? Let me finish okay. talking about uh, how the local organization was formed. And Patty Naaman was very, did a very good job of getting people from other organizations to join our steering committee. And we also formed a legal committee of people who were already lawyers to, but who lived in the area to help advise on uh, if there were other legal remedies besides going to Congress. And uh, Danny Sheehan took a lead role in crafting uh, the complaint. After he had a meeting with the legal committee who looked at his first draft of a case, which he tried to take back uh, to previous presidents in terms of uh, the fact that everything had been secret. The Atomic Energy Commission um, became the oversight body, but the bomb building was done in secrecy. The workers were told they could not tell their doctors where they had worked. Um, and that way, no, no one would know whether people were being injured from exposure to this ionizing radiation if nobody was trying to keep track of this. Uh, mm -hmm. I called up, so I, Someone gave us a grant for me to uh, work on trying to locate as many workers from the Cimarron plant as possible to see if we could do some sort of a fo health follow-up study. And uh, uh, another young man and I went through all of the publicly available records from the Atomic Energy Commission and the NR Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which was the successor agency. And if someone invited me to a meeting, I went and spoke. And often I, we would pick up a new volunteer from, uh, or several volunteers, depending on the venue. And it was at a point in time where a lot of groups had formed because there was a, either a new nuclear reactor in their neighborhood or because there was a proposed nuclear reactor. And uh, the uh, proposed Seabrook facility up in uh, New, New Hampshire, Hampshire experienced a large demonstration of people who uh, went onto the site for the purpose of getting arrested so that they could draw public attention to this issue. And the police I guess, bust them to this big stadium and they had to organize amongst themselves to sort of survive over 
the uh, I think they were there for about a week, but I don't really remember anymore. Uh, and so we would, I would bring people to Washington or invite people to Washington D.C. who were involved in nuclear issues at their location to help further educate the public about the dangers of nuclear reactors. And I thought that teaching people about the health effects of ionizing radiation might give people enough courage to challenge the nuclear weapons uh, processing sites. Well, uh, two years, just before the two-year statute of limitations would have been up, we filed a more focused lawsuit claiming that Karen Silkwood's rights as a labor union organizer had been violated when she was run off the road and, and died, and uh, that there were indeed real problems at the Cimarron facility. And one of those was that they used x-rays to see if there were any fissures in the nuclear fuel pellets that they were making. Mm -hmm. And she saw a worker uh, using black uh, magic marker to cover up what he claimed were photographic uh, mm -hmm. problems on the x-rays. But Karen recognized that the x-rays were supposed to show if there was anything leaking out of the fuel pellet. And so if you use black magic marker over the x-ray, that changes the mm -hmm. uh, picture. And the Atomic Energy Commission later verified that, yes, that had been happening. <laughs> and other things with quality assurance had been tampered with. Um, but they would always, Kermagee would always say, oh, well, we'll fix this, this problem. And there were quite a few reports where plutonium was missing or, or unaccounted for, and these reports were secret. Uh, the case that was filed went to trial in Oklahoma City, and by then the act Karen's death was not at issue because the, uh, there had been a ruling in the, the uh, court that this should not be part of the lawsuit. And the, so the trial in Oklahoma City was really going to the plutonium con contamination of Karen. And the trial occurred in 1979. It lasted almost two months. It had a team of attorneys, one of whom, Art Angel, lived in Oklahoma City at the time. And uh, he had no connection to Kerr McGee. <laughs> the, during the trial, the movie called China Syndrome came out, which showed that there could be an accident at a nuclear power plant mm -hmm. that would be devastating for the surrounding area. Then the Three Mile Island accident occurred, and although initially the uh, Initially, they claimed there was no nuclear meltdown. There was only an accident, but 
it did involve a partial nu nuclear meltdown. And that came, only came out a couple years later when outside physicists were allowed to visit the site and, and uh, look at their available materials. So the judge, the Kermagee asked that people be to, told not to go to the movie the China Syndrome, and so he just directed the jury not to go to that movie. They wanted to, like, uh, get rid of the whole case because of the this movie coming out, and uh, the judge just ruled that he would direct the jury not to go see this movie until after the trial. Then, when the Three Mile Island accident happened, they also wanted the jury sequestered. Uh, but by the time they asked for that, everybody knew there had been an accident at Three Mile Island, and the judge refused to uh, sequester the jury. He just asked them not to follow, follow the news about uh, the Three Mile Island accident so that they could remain independent in their judgment of this uh, lawsuit. So after a couple of months, th the jury deliberated and they decided that they believed Karen Silkwood. They, heard, they had heard t uh, an audio tape of a meeting at which two University of Minnesota scientists had explained the dangers of uh, nuclear materials and uh, had told them that their handling of plutonium could lead to cancer. And that the, the alpha radiation that uranium miners had been exposed to had already been documented and they had already found cancer increases amongst that worker population. Uh, the jury uh, gave a physical damages award of uh, around a thousand dollars, but they gave a punitive damages award of ten million dollars. So this was a big victory for the union and for the memory of Karen Silkwood, because when both sides were presenting their so-called facts, the jury decided that the uh, Silkwood case proved the dangers of ionizing radiation were real, and that people who advocated for people working with these dangerous materials should be heeded. And uh, the idea that th these dangerous materials were going to end up in a nuclear reactor that was called the fast breeder reactor um, was something to be alarmed about. Uh, Kermagee appealed this judgment to the district court for the Tenth Circuit. Uh, the district court overturned the decision on the grounds that uh, the punitive damages couldn't be awarded in a federal lawsuit. Although this ruling was later overturned, when both parties appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States and uh, the arguments before the Supreme Court were held in 1983 
and uh, one of the legal team members, Rob Hager, had gotten the attorney generals of uh, a large number of states to side with the uh, Silkwood estate. And so there had been argu arguments joined by the uh, national, by then it was the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, and so they pres they tried to defend their position that oh this wasn't really a big problem but the justices deliberated over the the their decision for quite a long time much longer than they usually do before issuing a judgment and on, in January 1984, they issued their judgment and said that uh, states were allowed to apply their state rules because that, that was how the system was set up, that each state could make the decision about whether this was... a uh, an issue that belonged in their courts and because Oklahoma had a provision for punitive damages that the jury was right to apply punitive damages because here was this huge corporation you know making handling millions and millions of dollars and uh, the lead trial attorney Jerry Spence had focused on this issue just before they sent the uh, jury into deliberations. And he said that Kerr McGee would not change its behavior unless its finances were affected. And I think that it encouraged the jury to levy Ten million dollars in punitive damages. And, yeah. Well, so this was a really a ten-year campaign, begun in seventy-three, seventy-four, and culminated in in this. I, it had to be a huge victory. Uh, yes. Know, that, uh, did you feel that that so was the end of the campaign? So after the Supreme victory? Court, right. you know, we were, oh, we've had a victory. Yeah. But when we read the decision. They sent it back to the Tenth Circuit because that's where the uh, their jurisdiction had come, um, and so that Kerr McGee could argue for a reduction in punitive damages. But still, it was a so we looked. At, we the organizers were going, wow. Everybody thinks that we, so we won this case, that this money has been given already to the Silkwood estate. And uh, we didn't think that we could raise enough money to go back to trial. Uh, even though we had a big national organization by that point in time. And uh, the case was finally settled out of court for uh, about one and a half million dollars so that Karen's children mm -hmm. actually received some money from our victory in the court. It helped enable those who wanted to go to uh, college to do that. And so we felt that this was a good outcome, all in all. Well, that was my last question. The, uh, what, do you, what do you feel, having been in every step of this Karen Silkwood campaign and winning that win, how, how, what do you feel, besides the awards to her children, and what, what do you feel were the greatest things that came from this uh, Karen Silkwood campaign? A legacy, um, so to speak. People began, 
across the country, the groups that were working against their local nuclear plant or proposed plant were all willing to help us on the Karen Silkwood case because they saw its relevance um, to the work that they were doing in their own communities. Instead of t giving statistics about the uranium miners, we had a real human being who had been damaged by her plutonium exposure. We be personally believed that the reason she became contaminated was that Kermagee wanted to get into her apartment and find any documents that she had uh, been able to gather because they had heard about the, the uh, because they were wiretapping conversations and uh, actually following some of the participants, the police, Oklahoma City police, were doing some of this. And uh, this network of people around the country later came together. We, we had a national no-nuke strategy conference. And uh, people from all around the country came up to Kentucky. Uh, and we had experts speaking about the d nuclear dangers. And uh, a member uh, who, of the armed forces who had been at one of the test sites, explosion, uh, the, the, I believe the Nevada test site explosions, um, decided that he he should make found an organization for the atomic veterans mm -hmm. and so they formed the national association for atomic veterans and uh, got some of these veterans to come forward and describe their t experience um, walking through the debris of a nuclear explosion. They said that they were to told to turn their backs and cover their eyes, but even with their eyes covered, they could t t um, tell when the nuclear explosion was starting. And a lot of uh, people had been brought in from organizations like the National Guard and so they weren't officially counted as participants at the testings uh, and there was no follow-up of the atomic veterans at that point in time and eventually uh, Congress passed bills for radiation compensation to people. Yeah, we're rolling. This is Lessons of the 60s. Today is August 28, 2015. We're in Washington, D.C. at the offices of the Institute for Policy Studies. Our cameraman is Paul Williams. Today we're talking Kathleen M. Tucker, known to us as Kitty Tucker. We're talking to Kitty about her experience in the Washington area impeachment coalition and the wonderful event called the inaugural anniversary impeachment ball. I'm Anka Decker. Kitty, tell us about your work and activities in 1973. Um, in the spring of 1973, I was a coordinator for the annual meeting of the National Free Clinic Council. And it was held up in, uh, it was held outside of Denver, up in the mountains uh, at the YMCA uh, community site where they had a lot of buildings and we had 
space to do both workshops and space to hold a, a general meeting. And um, a couple of the pe several of the people who had founded the national, uh, the lo our local free clinic in Eugene, Oregon, had uh, moved to Washington, D.C. and taken government jobs because of their prior involvement in, in the formation of the White Bird Free Clinic. And I had served as the chairperson of the board of directors at that clinic uh, as a, a patient volunteer. And so I was invited by I, some of the people who had founded the White Bird Free Clinic came out to speak at our conference in Denver and they urged me to come and visit them in Washington, D.C., where they said they had plenty of space and uh, I was welcome to come and visit. And so we had been, we had learned about the Washington break-in at Watergate, in, which happened in summer of 1972. And even on the West Coast, people were talking about it. They were saying how desperate Nixon must be that he was, uh, that his cam people with his campaign were breaking into the Democratic headquarters. And we didn't think it was the right thing to do. <laughs> However, sometime in the spring of 1973, uh, Nixon ap appointed uh, a special prosecutor to pr because after his election, re-election, he wanted to um, erase any doubt about his involvement in covering up the Watergate break-in. And uh, so I was out for a visit in Washington, D.C., and because we had access to mailing lists for the National Free Clinic Council, um, for the Institute for Policy Studies, and for the media, um, we said, well, let's draft the, an impeachment petition and send it out to all these people and start getting signatures so that peop our members of Congress would learn that there was an uproar over this event. And so we, while, while I was visiting, we went ahead and did that and we took the envelopes and the impeachment petitions and a let letter explaining what they should do with the signed petitions and sent them out to uh, all of these places. And uh, then, you know, we sort of shrugged our shoulders and went, well, that's what, what we can do right now. And uh, I went back to Eugene for the summer and uh, oversaw the women's night at the free clinic. And so when I came to Washington, D.C., I went to volunteer at the Georgetown Free Clinic and to work on the Women's Night. And uh, one, of the thing, one of the things we innovated was doing the pregnancy tests right in front of the women instead of going and hiding someplace and then coming back and telling them the results of the test. That way, they got to see it just as we did. And uh, they were able to decide what they wanted to do from that point on. And, and they could get referrals to uh, people who would deliver children or to, by then, the abortion rights choice 
had been declared uh, available by the Supreme Court. And uh, so we were able to, they were able to hear about what their choices were. Um, but then, as the Fox investigation was ongoing, there would be some information in the press about uh, how this in investigation was going and when they could expect a result. And so by the I, but I came back to Washington, D.C. to learn how the federal government really works, having gotten a good grasp in college about the way it is supposed to work. And uh, I had been very active in the anti-war demonstrations and the uh, civil rights demonstrations before them. and at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And so when Archibald Cox turned over his report to Nixon, Nixon asked the Justice Department to fire Cox. And uh, that was considered these uh, the Saturday Night Massacre, and the top two officials at the Justice Department resigned because they weren't going to fire the independent prosecutor. And they kind of urged the third in line to stay so that the agency would not fall apart. Um, and on the following day, People went to the Washington uh, the, friends, the Friends meeting of the of Washington D.C., which was on Florida Avenue, and so I went down there, and uh, they was informed that the national groups were meeting upstairs, but that the, the local people were meeting downstairs. And so I thought, well, I'm just doing local work at the moment as a volunteer for the women's clinic, so I'll go and see what the other local groups are doing. And at that meeting, we decided to form the, uh, the Washington area impeachment uh, organization and uh, Ted Glick and Peg Averill wanted, er, invited me over to learn more about my organizing background and we, we decided to meet again a week later and at that meeting I had the idea of uh, Gee, I wondered if we could hold an impeachment ball on the anniversary of the inaugural ball. And not only did they think that it was a good idea, um, one of the members of our committee who was a lawyer gave me the money for a, a down payment on space. And so I went and looked around at sort of area hotels and what they could provide. And by then, we had decided that we needed to, uh, we also needed to have an office for the group. And we held our first press conference and uh, announced that we were planning this impe impeachment ball, but only 
two organizations appeared. It was the AP and Roger Mudd. And so Roger said, well, let, let, us, let us know when you move into your office. We'll come in and uh, photograph you. So we uh, moved forward with the plans for the impeachment ball which was held on uh, the anniversary of the inaugural ball, and which turned out to be the event of the progressive movement for that season. Uh, we got a lot of uh, public service announcements to uh, advertise the fact that, that we were holding an impeachment ball. Um, we got space where if we got a larger crowd than expected, uh, they could open up other rooms and have a, a bigger main area. And uh, you did have a larger crowd than you expected. We did. The Washington Post reported that we had 2,000 tickets sold. And as we were, just, just the week before the impeachment ball, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, had sent the information about the ball out to all of their membership. But one, of, one or two of their funders complained that we were calling for Nixon's impeachment because of his illegal bombing of cities we of countries we weren't at war with and this was the because of the Cambodia bombing and the previous year there had the uh, San Francisco medical school all marched up the uh, street from the campus to the downtown area where people often held uh, protest events and and they wore their white uniforms and it was a very impressive showing so we said we're not going to take that out of our purposes and they said, well, we withdraw our support. And, you know, the first day we felt a little upset, but then we realized, well, I guess there will be no argument about how, much, how we split the money that we're making because we were selling tickets very rapidly. And uh, when we went to the hotel, which was at that time called the Ramada Inn at Thomas Circle. Um, we uh, found that the, we were being picketed. We were being picketed by the Moonies, who apparently didn't want Nixon to be impeached. And uh, Saul Landau said to me, you all, you already know you're a successful event if you've got these guys picketing. <laughs> and then we went inside and more and more people were gathering and filling the room. And we had uh, music that was played from records in the background, and then we had various speakers, and then Phil Oaks was our main at attraction on stage, and uh, he actually wrote a song uh, about the reasons that Nixon should be impeached. And then this song was recorded as a, a 45. And, uh, so that people all around the country were able to actually get copies of it, 
of his performance. Uh, after the impeachment ball, which the Washington Post even reported that we sold 2,000 tickets, and uh, this, since the Washington Post frequently underestimates a crowd, I felt that we could fe feel fairly certain that that was correct. <laughs> and uh, then we decided that we should uh, continue on as an organization, and we had raised money to pay a small staff. Uh, you opened a small office. Yeah, we opened an office on M Street, and Roger Mudd came with the cameras to film us moving in. And this was in the uh, by then it was the spring of 1974, because in order to be on the anniversary of the inaugural ball, um, it was 74 by then. And uh, so we had a, a two-room office on just near Thomas Circle. And the uh, number of people interested in what we were doing kept growing, and we were hearing from people who had organized their own local area um, organizations in many of the big cities along the East Coast and uh, east of the Mississippi. And so we sent out a call for these organizations to come to a meeting in Washington, D.C. And at that meeting, um, even though that I had not gone to the meeting of national groups, at this point we saw that the national groups were mainly communicating with their own constituencies and uh, weren't doing much independent assistance to all of the groups from other cities. And so we, during the meeting, people said, well, we want to come and lobby Congress. We want meetings with our Congress people and with the Judiciary Committee members. And so we said, well, we'll do everything we can to help set things up for you and uh, different members of our, at that point, three-person staff to, sort of took turns welcoming the busloads of people that were brought in by the, the local area organizations um, to actually lobby Congress for the impeachment of Nixon. The, Saturday Night Massacre resonated with the American public. And despite Nixon's promise during the elections to end the war in Vietnam, he was actually sending more people over there. Although in 1973, Congress ended the draft. Um, and the draft had become a very important issue for all of the male students who had defer deferments because they were in college but who were about to graduate, some of whom went to Canada, some of whom went through the process of trying to be um, assigned as non-fighting soldiers or to be excused from service and 
we had an or there was an organization that was had been advising people about the draft and worked out of the friends meeting house and they also had a peace group at the friends meeting house so it was a common place for progressive people to gather um, when we the organizations met, we essentially agreed to form a campaign to impeach Nixon. And uh, some organizations brought people just in cars to, to go do lobbying, and some brought a busload, and some brought, I think they were from Ohio, that brought several busloads of people. And so, can you restate that last bit? Because you uh, okay. all the rustling. So, just about the buses. There were, I need to put this paper clip down. <laughs> uh, so, there were many people that wanted to come and participate in the, the lobbying effort to get Nixon impeached. And so something that the previous spring I thought was impossible now seemed within reach. And uh, so I worked as one of the three coord coordinators um, along with Ted Glick and Brian Murphy, I think. Uh, But my memory has faded, and now uh, people's names I thought I would never forget, I've forgotten. But at least his first name was Brian. Uh, the uh, people coming to Washington, D.C. also came sometimes from their own organizations. And uh, someone with more than 100,000 signatures, which they had gathered up from the National Emergency Civil Liberties Union, came down. And no one wanted, n n no members of the committee were available to have, to actually receive the impeachment petitions. So instead, cameras followed us up to deliver them to the office of the committee. And uh, so the fact was that there were people who were willing to come in person, but there were also people signing our petitions all around the country and mailing them in or coming to deliver them in person. Uh, we had a lot of volunteers who came into our office and, and worked with us, um, or we never could have done, mailed all of the impeachment petitions out to all of those folks writing in and, and requesting the, the impeachment petitions. And we found that some people were willing to bring us the printed impeachment uh, petitions with their lines and, and 20 signatures per page. For, and uh, they were, some of them were printed at government offices. The, uh, we also mimeographed impeachment petitions as well. And uh, so there, there was a big, there were big mailing jobs of sending out information and also updates as more information became available, especially about 
Nixon's tapes of all his meetings in the White House. And uh, he wanted to have Fox fired because Fox had found, discovered that there were 20 some minutes missing from the impeachment tapes that they're experts on uh, audio recording were able to identify. And uh, they followed uh, the, some opening comments about the uh, Watergate break-in. And Nixon was claiming that he never knew about it. And he certainly didn't authorize it. But there was a lot of doubt about what he had said on those missing minutes of tape. And uh, so the special prosecutor would have recommended that Congress uh, hold hearings and in order to impeach the president, members of the House of Representatives have to vote out an impeachment uh, finding. And then the Senate has to hold a trial of, of the president. By this time, my husband and I had uh, gone out to spend the summer in at Rapid City, South Dakota, because my husband was working for Senator Aberesk, who came from South Dakota. And uh, Aberesk wanted him to get to know a little bit more about South Dakota. And so we heard Nixon's um, resignation speech on the radio because we didn't have a television in the little uh, apartment we were renting just for the summer. And so we were just overjoyed to hear this. And then we heard about the deal he made so that he could keep his, uh, that he could be pardoned by Ford, who was the vice president, and uh, he would be able to collect all of his sort of pension money, and there would be no trial. But the fact that he was resigning meant to us that he was admitting he had been involved in the uh, cover-up of the break-ins, whether or not he had authorized them. And that, that was a big victory for us. We uh, looked back then on how many, how many, the variety of people that had come and volunteered at our office we had high school students, um, two to four of them frequently came to help us out with mailings or just came to answer the phone. Um, by then we had more than one phone in our <laughs> office. And uh, we had retirees, we had people who came on their days off, we had people from various organizations around the area. And all of these people made the events that led up to re the Nixon resignation possible. Because after the um, House committee voted to for forward their impeachment uh, Finding, Nixon realized that 
well, this was the end. This was time for him to go. And we realized that the American public could actually have the desired impact on our government, but it took a lot of work. It took a lot of money. Uh, and Ted Glick was very good at raising funds from foundations and, and individuals who had given to the uh, war, fighting the war in Vietnam efforts and who were also supportive of the uh, impeachment goals. And so between the money that we had raised at the impeachment ball and then the subsequent money raised and some of the impeachment petitions would come in with checks because people understood that it took money to try and keep our effort moving. And I was sad that I wasn't actually in Washington, D.C. to go join the celebration, but I was very pleased because uh, this was something that, that I had helped make happen. How did that affect the rest of your life? Um, I decided that when I first arrived to live in Washington, D.C., I'd gone to a reception for the new uh, Democratic senators. And Michael, who was part of the film crew that was working with Saul Landau, came with a, a movie camera. And so he sort of got a lot of attention. Um, my husband, Bob, came in jeans and a uh, regular shirt. And people, and we, we got there before the event actually started because Michael wanted to find a place to set up so he could film for a, a movie that Saul Landau was making about uh, following sort of four members of the House and Senate. And I had, and nobody came up and introduced themselves to me or to my friend Norma. And I realized from that event that, wow, if you wanted to be recognized in Washington, D.C., you needed something more. You needed like your, your MD or you needed to be an attorney. And so this helped spur me to uh, go take the law school aptitude test. And uh, the following spring, I applied to law school and was accepted at the Antioch School of Law, which was located here in Washington, D.C. And at that point, we were living in a communal household that was within the boundaries of Washington, D.C. And uh, I was able to combine doing organizing work, which uh, by that time I was uh, working with people in the anti-nuclear movement. And so I went on to become an organizer of the anti-nuclear power plant movement, which morphed into the anti-nuclear power, anti-nuclear weapons community. And then I founded an organization called the Health and Energy Institute as a nonprofit corp organization that could receive tax deductible contributions and uh, worked on issues about 
involving people who lived near nuclear sites, whether they knew were nuclear power plants or nuclear we weapons production facilities, which I learned were spread all around the country in different states. And it seemed to me that nuclear sites did not make good neighbors and that uh, the people who were getting sick around these sites had a reason to suspect the sites were releasing radionuclear materials that could cause damage to uh, cells in the human body that could uh, manifest themselves in many ways. There could, when an exposure might uh, be from uh, can I take a break and drink some water here? Sure. Kitty, looking back on your work in those years, what do you see as the relevance for things now? Well, I believe that the impeachment campaign succeeded in ousting a president uh, who most of the public by then believed had been involved in uh, a cover-up of the Watergate break-in into the Democratic headquarters before Nixon's uh, re-election. And so, by the time uh, two Justice Department officials refused to fire Arch Archibald Cox for his findings of uh, discrepancies in the audio tapes kept by Nixon of all of his meetings in the White House, uh, it seemed kind of clear that he must have said something inappropriate and that what we had read in the newspapers about Nixon's promoting a cover-up was probably true and that he feared he would be found guilty if, he, if the Senate went ahead and uh, tried him. And so this was a victory that we never really expected when we first started circulating the first impeachment petitions. But we were kind of hoping, hoping that it would force him to honor some of his pledges to end the war in Vietnam. And uh, so I felt that it, it was to me a lesson that citizens could actually affect what happens with their government, but it's not an easy task. And that it took fun fundraising efforts on our part, it took special events and uh, forming a national coalition of uh, groups working on the impeachment issue and uh, it involved bringing people to Congress to deliver their petitions and to uh, lobby their members of Congress as well as the impeachment committee. And that there were people from many different cities willing to come to Washington, D.C. and do that because they felt their government had been their votes had been misled and that Nixon had not ended the war in Vietnam as he had promised and that uh, getting rid of Nixon would show that um, dirty politics wasn't something that we should be involved in. And it also encouraged me uh, to go to law school 
because women had made some strides in having their voices heard in the anti-war movement and in the civil rights movement and women's organizations had begun to form but the uh, number of uh, people who were willing to work on this issue and volunteer their time was really important to the success of our whole effort. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you so much for having me.